to start off, I'll do a brief overview of Jira. The top bar is where you set up your printer and change your settings. The middle is where your build plate is. So this will change once you update your settings. So for me, I have two profiles at under three and for my under five plus. So when you change it, you can see that how the build plate gets bigger or smaller depending what one I have selected. The lines here on your left is your left build plate when you're facing your 3D printer. This helps you know what way your print is oriented. Once you input your model, this left sidebar will appear. This sidebar allows you to move or position your 3D model. On the top right bar has the current settings. If you click on the bar, a simple setting menu will appear. And if you hit custom, it will open more options that you can use. You can control what settings you want to see by hovering over one of these top banners and hitting the button right here. And you can go through this and select what ones you want to have appear. I typically just keep it checked all. Profiles are an easy way to keep settings for different models. If you're just starting out, I'd use normal quality and just edit the variables to the specific ones I need. I start with normal quality because I am printing cosplay pieces that need to be sanded smooth, so high quality isn't necessary. Plus, it will save on time and filament. So you can also set custom profiles as well. So I have three currently, easy supports, a strong print, so if I have something that needs to have more support to it, when I print the blades of my swords, they need to be hollow. So I have all these settings already in it. So quality, we already talked about that a bit. Start with the standard quality if you're gonna do cosplay prints. If it's something that I don't want to sand, I will do dynamic or super quality, just depending on the item. So going on to walls, there's two settings I use in walls. The first one being wild line count. And fill helps keep the shape, but it doesn't really add that much strength. But upping this wall line count right here will give your print a lot more strength. So for a normal print, two wall lines with around 7 to 10% infill works fine. But when I make something hollow, I usually go up to 46 wall lines. Usually my blades will be four and then my handles or anything that's more supportive will be six. The next thing I will change is the Z seam position. So that Z seam is this right here, this line on the back. It's where the nozzle will stop and start the next line. So there's a couple different options. You can make this random. You can put it on the back, front or left. I usually keep it on the back and you can change what seams you want it on. So let's say I want it on 200. So now you can see instead of in the middle, it's over to the side. So typically when I do this, I will put it inside a print. It's just easier, well, you don't sand the inside of a print, so. so if you change it to the front, so change it to this corner right here, which is a lot easier to clean up and hide. So definitely play around with these on each of your uh, values to find out the best spot for you. Okay, so moving forward, the top and bottom, there's three parameters I like using. Top layer, bottom layers, and initial bottom layers. This is mainly for my swords, so this is what I would have in my profile. So let's open the blade piece. So right now we have a top and we have a bottom and that means that we can't thread LEDs through. So for the top layers, I'll push it to zero. For the bottom layers, for the initial bottom layers, I'll put it to zero. You want the bottom layers to stay the same because if you have any writing or text or anything in the middle, then it will miss a whole chunk of the bottom layers for that little section. And now the bottom and top are gone and then the only thing left to do is to zero the infill. And now you'll be left with a completely hollow print. And again, this one only has two lines going around, but if you want to know more information, you can just check out my other video tutorials on the mid splitter, and that goes into more detail about these settings. So next is infill. So like I said before, seven to 10% is optimal. You really don't need that much infill. 
uh, info pattern. I use Cubic for now. I'll be testing out the other one soon to see what one I like the most. Okay, so material, I just leave this I generally leave this the same because I tested my printer and I know what works. So I use PLA, so I go for 260 bed, sometimes even 50 on, a, on my small printer, depending on what my uh, room with my printers are like. If your printers are in a colder area, then obviously you want probably a hotter bed just so you keep it on the build plate better. Again, just do some print tests. They don't take long and you'll be able to figure out what the best temperature and everything is for your printer. So for travel, I typically leave this the same. I will slow it down a little bit if the printer keeps failing. So support, the thing that people are probably here for. So I typically use normal support. I know some people like using tree if the model is pretty detailed, but caution pieces aren't usually that complex. So normal is usually fine for me. Support overhang angle. I can get away with 65% on my Ender 5 Plus and 60% on my Ender 3. I've tested both my printers to see what the maximum amount of overhang they can achieve is and how much I'd be willing to sand and buff out. So support density, 7% is fine. You don't need more than that. So for support density, 7 to 10% is fine. I typically just use 7 and I use a brim to keep the support from knocking over. And the final one to make your support super easy to come off would be the support interface density. I usually up it, up it to 80%. And what this does is it creates more of a layer between your support and your model. So it's easier to come off and it doesn't fuse to your model. So if we look down right here, just before it starts reaching it, you can see right here that it's upping, upping the support density right here. So it's upping the support interface density right here. So that will create a nice a little nice platform that the model and the bed won't stick to. And build plate adhesion. I usually use skirt or brim. I rarely use raft, but brim mostly because of supports then supports like this tend to fall over so I like having brims on them to keep it better to the plate. And for brim line count I'll usually move it to 10. You don't need that much to make it stick. So another thing to note this eye will show you how much material you're using here. So infill here is 29 and the walls is 243. And it's using the inner walls are using 15% of that 130 gram. So over to the menu on the left. So most of you probably already know what everything does. The things that I found useful are here. The first thing is to make your uh, model layer flat. So you want the bottom of your model to be completely blue, especially if you're gonna attach it to another piece. So it's completely flush. If it's red like that, then that means it's not touching the build plate. And then you'll need support, and then that means it won't be completely flush. So use the lay flat option and make sure that your model is flat. So the next thing is a mirror function. I see this so many times on 3D modeling sites saying there's only half of a blade or half of a model. That's because they expect you to mirror it. So if you click this mirror right here, then you can mirror on XYZ. So for this one, I would just mirror it here. And now you have the other side of the katana. So then you just print out one like this and one on this side, and then you'll have a flush katana and exactly the same on both sides. So the next thing is support blockers. So for this one, I'll definitely want to rotate this to make it flat. So it's all green, so it's flat, but there's some red in here. So I like going into preview, and then that way you can see where your poles are, ended, are ending. And I do typically like using getting rid of support for uh, any dowels or any rods that you plan to put in anything. It's super hard to take it out, especially when they're this small. So it's easier, the 3D printer can gap this back and forth pretty easy so you really don't need supports in there. So you save on filament and time trying to get that out, which is usually impossible to get out anyway. So just save your headache and just print it without support and it'll be fine. And the next interesting things that you can do with support blockers is you can actually change the value of infill and all these settings depending where your support block is. So let's scale it up a bit. So let's say on a blade you want the tip to be a little bit stronger. So you put a support blocker on the tip, select the tip, and you go into the support, the per model settings. 
You can do modify settings for overlap, and then this is all the things that you can change. So for us, let's make, so for us, let's do, let's do infill, infill density. Add that over here. And let's say we want it completely 100% infilled on this top right here. So now when we go to slice it in preview, you can see that the top tip is completely 100% infill. So right here is when it goes into 100% infill. So I really like using this when I have a, only like a little bit of a piece that I feel like it's gonna break and it's a little delicate. So just changing that up or like adding more wall line count will make that small little area better. It'll make that small little area stronger. If you found this video useful, please consider subscribing and liking for more tutorials like this in the future. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys learned something new that you can use on your next project. Until next time, bye.